Your books on pages. Uh, I, I'm just. I'm going to start this off because I want to get into a lecture on different kinds of emotions, some of which are addressed in the book and some of which are not, um, which are really crucial. Very crucial for our understanding the struggle for intercultural adaptation. Uh, but first I want to make sure that you understand some of these primary concepts that are in the book that, that are not part of my uh, lecture. Uh, in, in many of your communication courses that you take, interpersonal communication, um, other communication courses, you're going to come across this idea of uh, the Johari window, which is on the page, bottom of page 37. So uh, let's take a look at that. You know, the author sets this up as uh, um, trying to understand the distinctions between uh, two different kinds of uncertainty, explanatory uncertainty and predictive uncertainty. Right? Explanatory uncertainty and predictive uncertainty. So what's the difference? Predictive uncertainty is basically like, you know, you can't know everything about a communication. Or what's going to happen, right? Yeah. You don't know what, in certain situations, you don't know what to expect. In, in new situations that you're unfamiliar with, you don't know what to expect. But you realize that, or that's why it is. Right, you realize that it's going to be something different, but you don't know what, what it's going to be. The interaction is going to be different, but you you don't know what what to expect. I mean, in in, in short, that's what it is. Okay, good. Oh, what about explanatory uncertainty? Somebody else? Explanatory uncertainty. Yeah. Okay. All right. So a little louder, please. Okay, good. So we have predictive uncertainty that's focused to the future, right? We don't know what's going to happen. And we have explanatory uh, uncertainty, which focuses on the past. We don't know why that happened. Right? In a, in a nutshell, you, know, you can't figure out what it was. Something happened, but you don't know what it was, or you don't know how to come to terms with it. You don't know how to understand it. All right, so. Um, the Johari window, then, is a way to configure these forms of uncertainty. Uh, and how many of you are familiar with this model? None of you? Really? This, a couple of you. Oh, okay, a few. All right, good. You want to try to explain it? Do you, do you want to give it a shot? Okay, good. Okay, I'll be back. Okay. Okay, so for the window, the first area is the open window. That contains information that others know about you, and you are aware of it. The second window is a closed window, and that contains information that you know about yourself, but others do not know about you. And then the window, the blind window, contains information that other people, yeah, that other people know about you, but you do not know yourself. And the third window, fourth window, is the unknown window. And that contains information that is unknown to those you get Okay. Fantastic. So we're interested in the blind and the unknown, although not, you know, we, we, we're interested in all of it, but uh, certainly you don't want to disclose everything about yourself, right? First time you meet someone. Although, uh, this, this is something that, that it, this might be staring many people, but certainly international students have reported that um, Americans are more likely to give a lot of personal information you know, in the first meeting or two. Now, you know, that's going to vary depending upon the person and the personality and the gender and the age and many other things. But, but, the, but generally speaking, Americans give more information about themselves in the first meeting or two than, than other, other people uh, in, in the world. You know. um, so the, the, the problem with that, uh, as some international students have reported, both firsthand to me and through other media and other means, is that it's difficult, even though they get a lot of information, it's difficult to develop friendships with, with Americans, especially kind of the college age group. So there's a struggle of developing friendships, so there's a question about intimacy. You can give me a lot of information, but gosh, you know, the real interest in developing an intimate 
I don't mean, I mean, I don't mean romantic, but you know, a good friendship, a solid friendship is difficult. So that's just an example that, that many Americans may not know about themselves. Okay? They'll give out all this information, but they don't think about it in terms of other people's perceptions of them. That's a blind side. Got it? So is it like information that people would think was not blind? Like well, you know, not necessarily, but but it might make them feel uncomfortable. Okay, that might like, wait a minute, that's a lot. It's TMI, too much information, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't need all that information. Uh, just give me the, the basics. We just met, for heaven's sakes, I don't need to know your entire relationship history in five minutes. So, so um, not understanding that that is the perception of international students, for example, this is just an example, illustrates kind of a blind side about self. Another way I like to think about a blind side about self is that you can't see your own face when you speak, right? Or in your interaction with other people. So there's information being provided to the person you're talking to that you don't have. Like my gestures, my facial expressions, how I'm doing all that, I'm gonna, you know, I don't wanna even look at the video. I don't even wanna, I don't watch it. So like Denzel Washington says, he doesn't wanna hear his voice. You ever, you hear about this about Denzel? You ever hear this? He had, I also heard him on a radio show once, and um, they were gonna play a, a bit from a movie he just made, and he left the room. He said, I don't wanna hear it, I can't, I can't do it. And he left the room. They were like, why? Wait a minute, come back. No, he's on the He's on the door. And then when it was over, he came back and said, what's up with He was like, I can't stand to hear my own voice. Because I think my own voice is terrible. And everybody's laughing, like Denzel. You're Denzel, you know? I mean, what's up with that? So, I mean, we, you know, there's things that we don't want to know about ourselves or that we can't know about ourselves based upon other people's perceptions. So that's the line. The blind side. The other part of this too is that as a foreigner in another country, you as a foreigner, especially if you're, if you're struggling with the language, you start to become more attuned to what? In communication. What do you become more attuned to? Yeah. Body language, gestures, tones setting, the environment, it's hyper-awareness um, of tonalities and gestures and so on because you can't understand the language well. You hear the strings of words, maybe you're trying to understand it, but because you can't understand the language, you become hyper-attentive to anything that's going to provide you with a clue to the meaning or the ideas or the feelings that are being expressed. Okay, so you can tap into the meaning vis-a-vis -vis nonverbal forms in ways that the natives to the place are not really paying attention to. Does that make sense? It's kind of like a phasics. Anybody know phasics or work with the phasic people? You know, there are certain um, forms of aphasia, a dominant form of aphasia. It was developed by a, by a tumor in the brain or by a head injury. Um, you know, or some other malady, typically, or stroke. Stroke is an off, often a, a, a common way that people lose the ability to understand language. Okay? They can't follow the semantics and the syntax of language. And so what they do is they compensate by becoming hyper-aware, Oliver Sacks calls it preternaturally aware, of the tones and the gestures of people speaking in order to try to get at what, what's, what the meaning is and what they're, what they're expressing. So as a foreigner in another culture where you don't understand the language, you develop a facing type symptoms in some ways, right? You're just hearing strings of sounds, but you don't know what they mean. And so you adjust, and this is one of the remarkable things, the human capacity to compensate and adjust for uh, these deficiencies in understanding the language. Uh, I know this well from my experience both in Japan and in Morocco. Uh, so, uh, the point is, in terms of the Johari window, 
is that as a result of that, you become more aware of the gestural and the tonal and the setting kind of attributes and constituents than the, the hosts, the native folks that you're with. You follow me? So you're seeing things that they don't necessarily pay attention to because they're into the language, right? They're just listening to the words. They're engaged. That's not to say they're oblivious to gestures and so on, but for them it's just natural, it's just part of everyday expression. You see it as new and different and, uh, you know, interesting, you gain insights into it. All right, so then there's the unknown and the unknown, and sometimes uh, through intercultural contact, and this kind of gets at, to some extent, the problem of uh, culture shock, which we're going to talk about more later, and we've talked about it a little bit already, uh, is that you begin to recognize things you didn't know before about yourself and about your society and about your culture and what you take for granted. All right? You'll start having feelings that you're not really sure about what they are uh, and, and so on. So we're going we're to get into that in a, in a, in a um, talking about paranoia, anxiety, and, and so on. Okay, so uh, that's the Johari window. Take a look at that. Uh, the the notion of these notions of disclosure on pages uh, thirty nine through forty one. Okay, so uh, disclosure. I'm just going to read from the book here. Disclosure is usually defined as the process of regulation of information flow between self and the outer world. Um, you know, self disclosure. You you express things about yourself to other people. It's as simple, simple as that. Um, the, uh, the author then tries to do a little play on this idea. He talks about closure, the process for dealing with uncertainty where an incomplete stimulus is perceived to be complete. You know, you want to cut off your awareness or your knowledge of others. Okay. Also, closure is a part of how do you end a conversation, right? You know, leave taking issues. How, how do you do that? You, you know what the regularities of practice are in your own culture, but you're not really sure how they operate in another culture. So, some closure. Um, what is what is recognized as um, normative in terms of self disclosure and how far you go? That's part of closure. Okay, and then there's this hyphen closure on page 41. And the author writes, in this process, people from different cultures together construct knowledge of their own and each other's identities and how to interact with each other. This is really important because what happens here is a negotiation process. You're coming from two different backgrounds, two different sets of expectations about what an interpersonal relationship or uh, conversation or dialogue entails, right? So you have these different regularities of practice that are associated with your socialization. As a result, you know, you don't expect the other to fully capitulate to your mode, and the other doesn't necessarily expect you to capitulate to their mode, and you have to negotiate it. Now, I'm not talking about arguing and so on. I'm talking about negotiation like, you know, you're in a raft going down whitewater rapids. That kind of negotiation. What do you want to do? Everybody been in a boat? You done a float? How many of you done a float? What happens on a float? What do you want to avoid? You go in the water, that's right. You don't want to drown. <laughs> what, what do you, in order not to drown, what do you have to avoid? Rocks and stuff. Rocks and falls and so on. I got to be in a boat with my two kids and, and we had a guy. And we had to be in the boat with the lead boat with the guy. And it was great because we had no problems whatsoever, right? But we would be leading the whole, you know, uh, you know gang of boats that were behind us. At one point in the river, uh, we went through this you know, area that was pretty difficult to negotiate, but, you know, he was... He was great. He wasn't he was doing a whole lot of the paddling. He was just telling us how to negotiate. And then when we got to a certain party, he said, okay, we've got to turn around. 
and you guys have to get ready to pull people out of the water. I said, oh, okay. And he turned around, and, and you know, the water's flowing, but it was a point where the boat stayed in one place, even though the water's flowing underneath, I forget what the technical term of that is. And we turned around and we watched, and just one boat after another kept flipping over. And we, we spent the next, you know, 30, 40 minutes pulling people out of the water. Because they didn't know how to negotiate that particular part, right? So I'm trying to draw an analogy between something like that, negotiating down a river, and negotiating a relationship, an intercultural relationship, where you're coming from different norms, practices, expectations, uh, and so on, okay? Gender relations, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so it's, uh, this is disclosure. When both people are invested in the relationship, this is what happens. This hyphen closure. You, 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 you learn together what is going to work for the both of you. Okay, so these are primary concepts uh, from the chapter uh, that I wanted to make sure that you had a good understanding of before we launch into the uh, lecture notes that I have up on the screen. Any other questions about any of the concepts in the book? Okay, so let's talk about these different uh, kinds of emotions. And I'm, I'm using the idea of emotion in a broad sense here. All right, I'm going to start with that anxiety. So what is anxiety? Uh, well, we all have anxiety issues. Uh, anxiety, we're making decisions with imperfect knowledge. Now there's a claim by you know, some psychologists that fear and anxiety are two different things. Do you agree with that? What's the difference? You know, the, the handout here says the, it's the differences between something that's very specific and something that's a little more vague. Does that resonate with you? You've been afraid of anything lately? Can you be afraid of dogs? No? Are you afraid of dogs? You're afraid of dogs? So when you see a dog, you freak out? Yeah. Your breath and stuff, or what? What happens? Yeah. So, you know, as long as the dog's not around, you're fine, right? So as soon as the dog shows up, you start having, you know, power pounding. It's like, oh, did you have a bad experience with the dog? It, no, I'm just, I'm just scared. Pardon? I'm just scared of them. Just afraid of them. Okay. Even like a little, even the little ones are even. They're, they're even <laughs> I have a dog that you won't be afraid of. <laughs> um, Okay, so very specific, right? It's a dog. Anybody else has any specific fears? Thunderstorm. Thunderstorm. You're in a thunderstorm, you start, you, like, it's very specific. You have some, you what? You're afraid the trees are going to fall on you or lights going to strike you? I don't you? like the loud noise. The loud noise scares the you? Thunder. Okay, great. Great. What, what else? Bugs. Bugs? Spiders, especially? Okay. So you see a spider, you want to kill it? It's like you were the spider, right? Okay, anything with more legs than you have, okay, yeah. Huh? Needles. Needles, right, okay. Needles, I mean, maybe you have a physiological reason. Do you pass out when you get a shot? Uh, no. There is a condition, the name of it, which I forget, where people who experience, you know, get a shot or a blood test or whatever, they, they pass out. What's the name of that? I the name of that. Yeah, you know what it is? It's happened to you before? You have to check that out. <laughs> I know a couple people who've had that and it's repeated multiple times. So all kinds of like sharp any sharp pain, not just a needle, but any any sharp pain, even if it's a minor pain, and uh, they they're out. Did you have to recover? I mean you had, Was it the needle pain or the blood? 
The blood? Some people just decide the blood to have some more kind of reaction. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's not it's not good, and you have to do this. It's, some people actually vomit as well. Um, you know, it's important to get your legs up and be in a position where you're not not going to drown. Uh, anyway, I'm just a little digression, right? So, so fear, fear. So anxiety is a little broader, a little vaguer. You may feel anxious because you know you're going to see the dog, right? Like the fear hasn't struck yet. Your heart's not pounding, but you know that this friend has the dog, and you got to go pick her up, and and you're anxious about. You know, I'm not going to go to the house, right? It's like no, no way am I going to that house. Well, the dog's outside. I don't care. I'm not going to the house. That's, you know, you have anxiety. Uh, so, anxiety is a little broader, and it's a state of being in some instances. Um, you know, you can have anxiety. How about anxiety in anticipation of giving a public speech? You have to speak in front of a large group. All right? So that's anxiety that develops. Feel in your stomach and so on. So, you know, there are ways physiologically to try to control anxiety. Breathing exercises, for example, exercise, um, you know, other things that you can do. Coffee is not a good thing to do when you're anxious, right? <laughs> and it's like, or alcohol. Some people say, okay, I'll just give you a shot, I'll be fine. You know, don't, you know, don't smoke a joint, you know, you don't do shots, you know, you know, the best thing to do is exercise and breathing exercises, and also talking to other people about it, verbalizing. Verbalization of the anxiety that you have helps to quell it. Another person's good listening to you is going to help you deal with that, with that anxiety. All right? So these are the main points uh, that you need to, to think about with regard to uh, anxiety. All right, let's talk about paranoia. All right, what's paranoia? It's brooding over feelings based on perceptions of others' attitudes or actions. It's a tendency to come to incorrect conclusions based upon the evidence of one's senses. All right, so you're misinterpreting the signs from another, their gestures or whatever. Now, I mean, you can have, you can have paranoia by the correct interpretation of other people's gestures or signs as well. Um, it, there's a destructive question of others' motives that sets in. This is, the, this is the key. You're thinking that others are talking about you, laughing at you, plotting against you. I mean, if this gets to be severe, you, you're, you're not just in mild paranoia anymore. You're paranoid. Period. You might need to get some counseling help. Uh, so, you know, the, the point here, the last, the last uh, bullet, and then I'll elaborate a little bit. Is that you have to recognize that in the intercultural context, you as a sojourner are subject to conversations by your hosts, by the, the native peoples of the place. They're fascinated by you. Uh, they find your actions and practices interesting and different, and they are uh, different from their own practices. So the best thing to do is to bring them out the open and engage in some dialogue. So let's talk about this a little bit, because this is a very common experience for people who are trying to adapt to another cultural world or a new, uh, new organization or a new, you know, whatever the, the situation might be, where the social world that you're in is, is significantly different, if not radically different, from what you're used to. All right? So um, when you think that people are talking about you and laughing at you and so on, you know, what's the big deal about that? Why, why is that such an issue? It's a, it's a matter of insecurity, right? You're thinking like, well, insecure, I'm not really, really sure what's going on. Um, Gregory Mason has a story of when he was in Bali and he was around a campfire and he was learning the language and trying to understand some of the practices. It was at night, and then you know the natives of the place were there, and and he would say something, and, and they would break out laughing. And he's like, oh geez, you know, I don't know what I said, but they thought it was funny, and they think it'd be funny, and 
trying to, trying to struggle and kind of. And then you know, the night would go by, and after a while, he'd say something else, and they'd break out laughing again. And they look at him and point at him and clap him and I go, oh jeez, you know, I thought I got that right, you know. Oh well. Same thing would happen to his work. Finally he realized that every time they laughed, he'd gotten it right. Where his assumption was the laughter indicated he got it wrong. So you can't always interpret the gestures of others as representing what you think it's going to be from your cultural point of view. So they were like impressed? They were impressed. He they were celebratory yeah. because he got it right. And so they're laughing. Okay, so, so um, my experience has been that whenever I have started to feel some mild paranoia or uncertainty about what's going on, and that I may have kind of screwed up or you know, done something, that the best thing that I can do in those situations is just kind of back off, you know? And give it time. And then talk to somebody uh, who has knowledge of the situation and the cultural practices generally, and just try to get some perspective on what was going on. And that's the best way to deal with mild paranoia. You must anticipate that people are interested in you and they're going to talk about you and they're going to find some of the things you say and do as funny. Or, in, you know, not just funny, but, but interesting. Because of the difference. Because the differences stand out. The other thing is that you're, you know, to the degree that you're open to learning, this is what intercultural adaptation is all about, to the degree that you're open to learning, you're going to recognize how your practices and rules and assumptions function in ways that you've never reflected on before. So you'll be beginning, you'll begin to see yourself through their perspective and open up some blind spots about you that you that you didn't you know have access to before. This is a good thing because you're becoming more culturally complex. To the extent that you run away, you know, then you know you give up on it. You say, "All oh, these people are crazy," and you know, they're laughing at me all the time, or they think I'm stupid or funny, or they must be talking about me. You ever had that experience? You think people are talking about you? They hugs you? Interculturally? Can you give me an example? Yeah. Um, last Thanksgiving, I went to Canada. That's definitely the case in many cultures where the kitchen is, you know, that's off limits. Yeah, I did yeah. not know that. But not only that, there's a status difference, right? Yeah, there was. Did you, just, did you lower yourself by going in? Yes. You lowered yourself in status by going in. Let's do right. it. That's <laughs> a great example. So by going into the kitchen in Panama at, this, at these people's house, you were a nanny, and, and uh, by, by, by crossing over and saying, you know, in America, no problem going over the dishes, right? Yeah. 
But there, it was no, there's a, there's a firm, invisible barrier. You crossed it. You crossed it, and the result was astonishment, right? They were astonished. What are you doing in here? And, uh, uh, and you learned your lesson. I'll bet you didn't go back in the kitchen again. You know? yeah. Good. Excellent. Any other examples? Yeah. Nice and loud, so. I was just on vacation uh -huh. with my stepmom, and she's Mexican, and her family was there, and they all speak Spanish, mainly. I think they can speak some English, but like, I would say something that made perfect sense to anyone that speaks English, but. You were using English or Spanish? They're using English, yeah. And then they would say something that didn't quite make sense to me. Like, it's kind of hard to explain, but like, the fact that there was like a language barrier made it very difficult to make the ideas to the point where they just started like charading me. Like, they were just playing charades. Charades, yeah, you know, you what? That's good. That's good shit. Did you get more understanding using charades? Yeah, like, yeah. her mom speaks no Spanish whatsoever. She was able to convey ideas like, yeah, they went to swim, they went to swim, and they went to swim, and they Excellent. Okay, so this is another. Uh, situation in which you don't understand, you're having trouble communicating, and you don't ordinarily uh, perhaps use your body to communicate gesturally in your uh, home culture or people speak your native language in the ways that you're compelled to do when you're trying to communicate uh, with someone who doesn't, you don't share a language, or they got very little bits of each other's language. So you start using gestures in novel ways, right? You create signs. Right? You create, you know, various kind of use common gestures and then you create signs and you try to draw things out. This is really important. It's a good it's a good practice to try to do this. And it means that you have to be less inhibited in terms of your expressiveness. Great example. So, you know, you're kind of able to overcome your feelings of deficiency or lack of language or paranoia by experimenting with new ways, kind of trial error experimenting with new ways of communicating. Uh, you know, move into the meta realm, asking people about language, finding language to talk about language. You know, to try to, to try to get an idea across or try to understand what someone else is trying to express. Okay, great. Any other examples? Yeah. Um, my family is from Spain and the way that you see there is like when you go out to a restaurant or a bar, there's people of all ages there. Like, alcohol is prohibited from children, yes, but they have ice cream at the bar. Because when you go to a bar, right. it's like a restaurant, mm -hmm. and you bring everybody with you from like 16 year olds, 4 year olds, and you were right. eating tapas at the bar. Right. And then I just see all the kids throw like all their garbage up the floor, and I'm like, what are they doing? You can't do that. You're at a restaurant. Uh -huh. Turns out that what you do is you go over there and you're at a bar at a restaurant. They throw everything on the floor and then it, they clean it up later, like at the end of the day. Yeah. When the restaurant. Like we do with peanut shells, right? Yeah. You have to be careful with your peanut shells if you're going to a baseball game or something. There. Yeah, but like there is everything from toothpicks. Shell the shell. Okay. All right. Good. So you had some problems in doing that. Yeah, because I was trying to find a garbage can. <laughs> what are you talking no, about? No garbage can. Uh, okay. I don't remember that part being in Spain. I mean, I, I was in a lot of restaurants in Spain, um, but I, you know, generally, I, I think that there is, there is that kind of practice. Where you know simple stuff like that, where we're not accustomed to it here, we would consider it littering. But there's someone's going to be cleaning it up after. Do you have anything you want to say about that? She had wine and I was like expecting to drink it, so like we like I open it and I'm like, okay, 
for myself a glass of wine <laughs> for lunch because that was like what I was used to. And then like my stepdad, he's like one of those like really strict Americans. Uh -huh. And like he saw me and he got so mad that to me that was normal. So I was like Oh no. Yeah. Well, so you can't drink wine anymore? <laughs> Just when I see my dad. <laughs> Just when you see your dad. Great great example. Yeah, so wine for lunch, wine for dinner, beer. Uh, different ages, but there is, yeah. Um, part of my family lives in Thailand, and my aunt is from the Philippines. Um, and she's always like pattering her face to be like pale, or she tries to stay pale. And like here, everyone comes to the hand, but there is like a sign that like that black people are white, they're not brown. And also, they have like maids, so. My aunt always wants to, and my aunt is German, he's like, oh, you don't need to. And she's like, no, but the group is kind of it's kind of Right, okay. All right, good, great examples. Um, so status is big, and you know, differences in practices, and trying to get adjusted to that uh, is a struggle, you know, emotionally. Because uh, oftentimes we're linked to identity and access, Access to resources, access to wine, um, access to certain spaces in a house, you know, all of these things um, are operating. And when we cross those boundaries, you know, so you get a reaction, right? And you're not sure what, why, you know, why did I get that reaction? Why, why did my stepdad get so angry? I just poured a glass of wine, what the heck, you know? Or, or why, did these, why did these, you know, maids in the kitchen Everybody gets upset, I just walked in, or, you know, I want to get a tan. No, you don't. <laughs> Not if you're in Thailand. Uh, it's going to have a different status, uh, uh, kind of a value uh, to, to that. So these are, these are really great examples. Okay, another emotion is burnout. You all ever had burnout? You think? You've been burned out? Where's, bur where's burnout come from? I'm burned out. What's it? How did that? <coughs> what? Yeah. When you work, just work too hard. Or... Yeah, right. You just work too hard. You just you're overworked. Your caseload. I have social workers, right? Any social workers? Any social work? Anybody in social work? Going into social work? Nobody? Really? That's unusual. Pretty big department here. Yeah, a lot of social workers, they work overtime, they put, put in a lot of time, they have a big caseload, and uh, you know, they have to deal with lots of different people, and it's exhausting. So, you know, burnout comes uh, through workload, certainly. Um, but it also comes when we don't meet our own expectations. You have to work extra hard to get something done in the new cultural world, this different cultural world, than you had to do in your home culture. All right, you following me here? So it's linked to exasperation. Exasperation. You go to another culture as on a work assignment, you have certain kind of uh, deadlines, work tasks that people are assigned to and so on, uh, and you expect all of that time, meeting the deadlines, tasks that are being performed and so on, to, to be done on time and so on. And then you find out it's not happening. And you have to work extra hard to do it yourself, or you have to work extra hard to get other people to do it, uh, or you know, vice versa. So part of the problem here is in recognizing what is expected in the new work environment. You know, how it's organized, how efficient it's going to be, um, different times of the day. Right, make a big difference in Morocco and other Mediterranean countries, certainly Spain. Uh, you know, you work in the morning, and then you know you have a period of time from about one or one thirty in the afternoon till maybe three. It depends on where you are, or so where you know it's it's, it's siesta or it's just you know you, you're like nothing's open. And then work starts again later in the afternoon and goes later than it does here. So, you know, adjusting to the time constraints in the other culture is really important. Really important. Understanding what they are. And also holidays and, and other um, 
periods during the year where nothing is done. Like August, in many cultures, countries in the world, nobody works in August. Right? August is time off. And uh, if you expect people to be working during that period, forget it. You know, if you're not going to get any done. If you're in an Arab Islamic culture, not just Arab, but any Islamic um, society, during Ramadan, everything changes. You know, people fast during the day. Very few places are open. Work doesn't get done. At night, it's a different story. You're up at night. Sometimes work gets done at night, but you know, people are out and in the streets, and it's kind of like you know, festival, festive time at night. So if you don't understand the constraints of the place that you're in, whether it's in a new national culture or a new organization, a corporation, or a new university, or whatever, then you are potentially going to get burned out if you keep fighting it and don't understand the realistic uh, goals that should be set in that in that context. All right, so. Um, it's important to realize here and in other situations that, that you're not alone. You have to seek out people you trust, try to get some perspective from uh, folks who are native to the place, your hosts, others who have lived there for an extended period of time, who can provide you with some guidance. Very important. When all else fails, take a All right, de-individuation, this is a really interesting phenomenon. And I've actually given you an example of this already. It was my own example of trying to take pictures of police in Morocco, which was a good example of de-individuation. Of course, taking pictures of police here in the United States is not something that they necessarily welcome, but it happens all the time, right? It's posted on websites and Facebook and so on and so forth. But, um, Individuation is a is when uh, you lose your sense of self as defined by and through familiar others, family, friends, colleagues, when you're in a strange environment. So as a result, the sanctions for conduct that typically are part of our lives seem absent or are you know significantly reduced. So then, because of that perception or misperception, you engage in conduct that you wouldn't ordinarily engage in. Atypical conduct when these sanctions are, are reduced. So you, you tend to lack the relationships and you misconstrue potential um, consequences of actions, their impact on others, and so on. Okay, so we've actually had a recent uh, situation with this. It was, uh, you know, Everybody in the world we get familiar with. You know what I'm talking about? Media jumped on it finally. It's finally dissipated because the Olympics are no longer going on. What am I talking about? Talking about Brian Lockie, right? And his his swimming buds. What they do? They're in Brazil late at night. They drank too much. But you want to explain the situation? This is a classic de-individuation, what these guys did. You're talking about when they went to the gas station yeah. and snapped the sign down, and then when uh, the cops came or the police, uh, they were trying to leave, and then the cops pulled the gun on them and told them, if you give us like, however much money you have right now, you can leave. But then he went out and told the story that they pointed out the gun on his head and demanded money. And, all this stuff, so he lied and they had to bring it back. Yeah. Now he's on Dancing with the Stars, right? <laughs> oh, he did? Two people got arrested for jumping yeah. on stage with him. So there you go, de individuation. Whoops, can't do that. Yeah, but I mean, the, the point at which they got in trouble was the you know damage they did in the, in the bathroom, right? Well, it turned out that was a lie. So there was, they did something, what they did. Yeah. But they knocked, did they knock the sign down intentionally? It was like, you know, probably. Uh, okay, all right. And 
then everybody jumped on it. Any other examples? Any individual issues? What about coming to, coming to the university for the first time? Coming to, coming, coming to uh, college for the first time? You're away from home. Maybe this is the first time you've lived outside your parents' home. How many of you? Raise your hand. Oh, come on, don't be shy. It's got to be more of you. Find a fresh friend. Okay, so the first time you live outside your parents' home, you're not subject to the constraints that are ordinarily operating within that home. You know, I mean, your parents are hoping that they've socialized you enough that you're going to be able to create your own constraints of what's acceptable and not acceptable conduct. But those constraints are gone, and so you may think that, gee, you know, I can do this now that I wouldn't be able to do it at home if you had that experience. And then you find out, gee, I can't do that here either. <laughs> Whatever it might be. Like, you know, having wine, wine for lunch over at the cafeteria, right? <laughs> you bring your own bottle. What? What do you mean? I can't have wine for lunch. This is a public institution. You can't bring alcohol on the grounds without special permission. Blah, blah, blah. Any other examples? De individuation. Now, sometimes you're going to run up against situations where you may have the right to do what you are doing from your own home culture, um, but the host culture doesn't recognize that right. Follow me? Like being critical of the government, or if you're in Singapore, chewing gum gets the law. Don't chew gum. Don't take gum. You will not be allowed in Singapore with gum. Why? 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 What do you think? No gum in Singapore. People stick at places? Yeah, people stick at places. They find it everywhere. What? Well, it's a law. No gum. I guess. You know, you're walking down. Americans chew gum, especially American men. American men chew gum. Men in other parts of the world don't chew gum. The men chew gum in England. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. In Morocco, if you're a man chewing gum, it's considered effeminate. If a man is chewing gum, it's a sign he's an American or not native person, even if you blend it in in various other ways. I mean, I'm going to disagree. <laughs> I you don't. I don't want you. So you don't see men chewing gum. Anyway. Right, so, you know, you have to be aware of the laws, even however idiosyncratic they may be. And, you know, if you feel as though you have the right to express yourself in a certain way and want to continue doing it, you have to make a plan for what's going to happen when you run up against the law. Yeah. Uh huh. A German bartender knows that I'm somewhat American because he asked for three drinks like this. This. Right. Three drinks instead of this. A good example. I mean, so did he get? He got shot. He got shot. <laughs> oh well, you know what? That was the only thing in World War Two. You know, also in France. Was this in France? Was it said in? What's another way to spot Americans who are trying to hide their national identity in a restaurant? This is a, this is a true story. Yeah. Okay, eating with your left hand. Eat, eat with a fork, right? Yeah, so what Americans simply do, they knife and fork, and then they switch, and they put the fork in their right hand, and eat with their right hand. Dead giveaway, you're American, you're under arrest. Yeah. Cut with a fork, right. If they're cutting with a fork, you're an American. <laughs> you don't cut with a fork, that's what the knife is for. Duh. It's a matter, you don't know how to use two hands when you eat, what's up with you, you know? The question is, how do you get the mashed potatoes on the fork in your left hand? You know, this is the problem, right? We 
but you have to eat off the back of the fork as well as the front of the fork. You need to practice this before you go. Eating, the eating and different styles of eating are really interesting, and we'll talk more about that at other time, especially when you eat with your hands, and there's no utensils whatsoever, so we'll come, we'll come back to that. Okay, de-individuation, disconfirmed expectations is next. This is, uh, again, a, a situation where we, we build up expectations based upon what's normative in our own work environment, right, in our own society, uh, what's expected of our, of our, of our work there. Um, there's also different notions of what constitute uh, good work, you know, what constitutes uh, success, what, what's an actual accomplishment. So you have to get clear on what the meanings of these things are um, as you engage in your work in the new uh, organization, corporation, cultural world, whatever, whatever the case may be. So sometimes you learn this the hard way, uh, you make mistakes and then it comes back, or again, you try to do too much and you get burned out. So disconfirmed expectations often result in confusion. Reaction stems from the contrast between one's expectation and the actual achievement of the expectation. So there's an incongruence between the expectation and the reality. And you have to try to deal with that. You gotta, you gotta negotiate. How am I gonna figure this out? How am I gonna adapt and be flexible or set standards and, and anticipate the behavior of the, of the people who I'm working with or teaching, or in the case may be, to, to follow, to do what I, to do what I ask. Uh, classic example of this is when I taught in Morocco. This is in their old uh, system, which was based on the French system. I was there on a Fulbright scholarship, a, a research teaching uh, scholarship, and uh, classes started in October. Right? And they go the entire year. So can you imagine being in this, in this class until May? Right, so, so there's a very set curriculum. All students have to take this curriculum and no other curriculum during the entire year for four years. All right? So that's the first thing which I knew about. And then, you know, I'm there on Fulbright. I'm, I'm the teacher. And I've been assigned to teach these classes. And the class starts on October 1st. So the night before the class starts, we're having a little soiree, a little party at the house. And um, I have some colleagues, some of my new colleagues that are, that are uh, you know, in the same university where I teach. And they say, I said, yeah, I'm getting ready to go to, to class tomorrow. They're like, oh, no, you don't, you, don't, you, don't go, you don't need to go to class tomorrow. I said, wait a minute, class starts tomorrow, I gotta go to class. No, no, nobody will be there. <laughs> yeah, you have to wait a couple of weeks and then people will start showing up. I said, what? You know, you, you won't, there won't be anybody there. You just, you know, that's how it is. They just, it's a slow start. We kind of get things going about mid-October and then uh, it's, uh, then people start coming. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. You know, I'm all ready to go, I got a syllabus. Like I'm going to class in the United States, we have assignments due and so on and so forth. I have lectures laid out. I mean, I'm geared up. I'm ready to go. And I just basically said, you know, fuck it. I'm going to go anyway. Right? So I did. And I walked into an empty classroom, and nobody showed up, just as I was told. But I stayed there the whole time. And every now and then, someone, uh, like a student, would walk by and kind of look in it, and then go away. Okay, well, okay. The message got out. I went back the next day, not the next day, but I think it was a, a two-day a week, I think, um, class. I had, you know, the class was supposed to have something like 35 or 40 students in it. I had five students. Five students showed up. 
No other students or faculty anywhere else in the building. But I had five students in the room. And I'm happy and we're just talking about stuff, right? The following week, I had 15 or 20. They heard, word got out, hey, the American's there. <laughs> you know? Better go. And so, you know, by mid-October, I had the full class. Not only had the full class, but I had, I think I mentioned this to you last time, I had more people than were in the class because they're interested in American culture. So, you know, I certainly didn't expect that. It wasn't that I was great, you know, it's just that I'm an American teacher and they're gonna learn stuff about the United States and about America that they didn't know before. At one point during the semester, the whole room was full, there were like 70 seats, and I had people in the hallway. I had standing room only in my class, and there were probably 70 or 80 people there, but only 35 were in the class. And I didn't know, I couldn't know who was who. They're all mixed up. And we'd do attendance, you know, I'd send out attendance and, and, and that kind of thing. Okay, so these expectations, you have to move with these kinds of differences in um, adapting to another culture, especially in a work-related environment. If you're a tourist, it's different, it's a different thing, right? I mean, tourist, you're really in, in closed, um, you're limited in terms of what you can really engage in, and, and so on. The adaptation is, is very, very different. You know, you're moving around a lot around the bus. But when you're there living as a student, as a teacher, as a worker, as a manager, as a government official, and so on, um, you're going to come up against these different expectations. Okay, belonging. Belonging, ambiguity, okay, these two, the last two, okay? All right, belonging. <clears throat> this is really important. Do you have a question? What's the difference between like this and burnout expectation and burnout? Well, burnout is based upon your keep beating your head against the wall, you know, trying to force a situation that's not going to change. So that's part of this confirmed expectations. All right. So if I start uh, taking attendance day one in Morocco, and I'm, getting, I'm taking off people's points because they're not showing up, right? And then everybody's going to fail the class because nobody was there, uh, you know. And I'm like, damn it, this is how it should be. I'm not adapting at all, right? And I'm, and, and people start not liking me and not coming to class anymore, right? So you create a situation where things just get worse instead of better. So flexibility and adapting and trying to accommodate the new normative structures of the place that you're in, the folk ways, the mores, the norms, the values that are associated with that place, and come to terms with them and work with them is key uh, to avoid burnout and disconfirmed expectations that are associated with burnout. Yeah, they're intimately uh, connected. Any other questions about anything we've covered so far? Okay, belonging. Fear of being excluded or becoming outcast is presumably greater than of dying. That might be debatable. Uh, think of the trauma involved, for example, of being excluded from a family or a group that you have been intimate with, or not being allowed into a group that you want to join. So sometimes these are life threatening feelings of rejection. Right? Uh, rejection is, 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 is one of the worst things that feel if you're being rejected from a group that you belong to or that you feel very much a part of. Uh, being fired from a company, for example, right? And you had no idea it was coming. Uh, um, or, you know, being um, excommunicated from a religious group because of something that you did or didn't do that you thought was just a simple mistake. Okay, so these are, these are, uh, Struggles, major struggles. So we belong to both voluntary and involuntary groups. Those that are involuntary include family, ethnicity, race, clan, and even class. Those that are voluntary groups include political, religious, organizational, community groups. All right, there's these different provisions that are fulfilled by social group relationships. 
social integration, attachment, sense of reliable alliance, reassurance of worth, guidance, maturity <coughs> from maturation, uh, and so on. You know, we want to um, uh, feel accepted. We want to be able to feel that what we feel is accepted, how we express ourselves is accepted, uh, that we're validated, uh, and so on. And that we know what it means to have intimacy and what it takes to become intimate in a relationship with others as part of a family or extended family or a clan or an organizational group or a team or you know whatever whatever the case um, whatever the case may be. All right, so these we're talking here about you know need fulfillment. And we know that the needs are not fulfilled, uh, especially emotional needs needs for intimacy, needs for belonging, um, then there's, you know, a, a loss. You feel lost. You don't, don't really know where to go or what to do, uh, how to depend on somebody else. So a lot of this has to do with interdependence, okay? When you are adapting to another cultural world, you're going to find yourself depending on people for things that you didn't have to depend upon other people for in your home environment. Right? We're talking about basic stuff here. You get an apartment, go ahead. Good luck. I'm going to go search for an apartment. Oh, yeah? Well, you're not going to get one. Why? Well, because there's these steps, these procedures that you have to go through in order to get an apartment, and you don't know what that means and what to do. When I lived in Japan, I was told first couple days that I was there, and this is by a company, uh, you know, a language company that hired me. They met me at the airport. I was immediately part of a group, part of that company, part of that organization. I was welcomed by both Japanese and American and Australian and New Zealand and British folks who work in that company, enveloped by them, and then guided through the process of getting an apartment, and the first thing was gift money. You know what gift money is? What? A bride. Well, it's, here, it's, 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 we, well, this is it. You know, we will think it's a bribe. I, I got to pay a bribe in order to rent an apartment. Uh, well, it's not a bribe. It's gift money. You have to give. The owners of the apartment building $200 for the privilege of renting the apartment. What well, we, well, we call that a deposit here, right? But you don't get it back. <laughs> so it's not a deposit. It's gift money. All right? And you have to meet the owners of the place. You have to, you know, sign the contracts. You have to engage with them kind of on a familial basis, depending on where you are, of course, if you're in a large uh, city with you know, a building with many apartments in it, it's going to be different than if you're in a local community, which is where I was, or our community. All right, so uh, you depend upon others to help you with that. How do you hook up the water? How do you hook up the electricity? Oh, you just call the electric company, right? What if you can't speak the language? You need help. You want to go to the market and buy some stuff. You know how to do that? We're not talking about grocery stores here. We're talking about local markets. Not you just going to throw stuff in your cart and go to the checkout and check it out and give them money, right? You go to the market. You have to weigh out your own stuff. I'm thinking about Morocco if you're more. You have to know the language of the fruit and the vegetables, <laughs> right? You have to know how to negotiate that in the, in the place that you're in. And so you need people to help you with these things. You learn have to learn to depend upon people's goodwill that you were not accustomed to here. And you also have to learn what is the difference between a gift and a favor and an obligation. Okay, so in Japan, when I was adapting to Japan, it was the fellow 
who was working with me to get me a, a, adapted and, and adjusted and into an apartment and, and uh, show me around. That was his job. It was his duty or obligation to help me. I, you know, I developed a friendship with him. He, he offered me many, many what I would consider to be favors, but there was no real expectation for me to have to return the favor. So, you know, that's kind of the definition of a true gift. You, know, you give without an expectation of return. That's that kind of a true gift. But there are other situations where if someone does you a favor, there's an expectation that you owe them, right? That that it's it's building up. And how are you gonna how are you gonna do that? How are you gonna be able to repay that favor that they have granted you? Right, so belonging is a very complex thing. If you're part of a family or a group that is very intimate, then the favors are reciprocal. People give and take all the time. Okay? You, you share things back and forth. If you're part of an organization, it's going to be different depending upon the hierarchy, what the status is of the different people that are, that, who are involved. So figuring this stuff out is part of learning how to belong to a, uh, a place, to a group of people, whether it's in an organization, whether it's in a family, uh, a university, community, a neighborhood, uh, and so on. Okay, so maybe in some cultures, if you, if you move into a, a neighborhood, it's like joining a club. You have to participate in the neighborhood in a certain way. You have obligations as a resident of that neighborhood to do certain things. Okay, so, so this is all a part of belonging and being brought in. If you can't find that entree to a group in another cultural world and you expect to stay there for a long period of time, it's going to be tough. It's going to be a more difficult type of adaptation. All right, ambiguity. It's our last issue. There's both positive and negative forms of ambiguity. What's an example of bad ambiguity? Good ambiguity. Let's talk about good and bad ambiguity. What's good ambiguity, bad ambiguity? Any of you have any bad ambiguity issues? What's ambiguity? Ambi means two, right? Two. Two what? Two means. Two interpretations are operating seemingly at the same time. Right? So there's there's Instances where that can be good, and there's instances where that can be bad. Can you think of some examples? Yeah. This is going to be like this, you know. What's yeah? Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. The line. Yeah. Up or down? Okay. Up. You live down. You're dead. Right. You eat by the line. What? It's opposite of you. Oh yeah, because you're, you're, you want them to get eaten by the lion, right? So, Like this? I'm sorry, let me do it. Oh, like this. It's like putting 
Right. And where is this that means this? I have no idea, but I just like Where in Brazil? In Brazil. Wait, know this for a fact? Yeah. Mom's, mom's uh, fiance's from Greece. And like, he was like saying, like, you know, fuck you, whatever. You'd be like that, like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I first, the first time I went to Morocco in uh, 1996, I can't believe it was 20 years, but uh, 1996, so uh, I'm, I'm shepherding 19 uh, students, and I have a couple colleagues, I mentioned this before. And we're, we did a lot of traveling around. And the uh, one of our local guides, right, we'd get on the bus and we'd both count, we'd count heads, make sure we're not missing anybody. And so I would, I'd be at the back of the bus counting, he'd be at the front of the bus counting. And then if we both stopped counting, he would do this, meaning that everybody is there, right? And I would do this. Which means, what in Moroccan? No, it's not what you think. It means zero. It means for his interpretation was we're missing somebody. That's how he interprets. So he'd look at me and he'd go, and he'd start counting again. I said, no. He's like, that's why I'm just back and forth in the bus, right? I mean, so I'm counting again too. I mean, we're both counting until the Friday if we finally talked. And I said, well, this means okay. And then he goes, well, name in Morocco means zero. <laughs> this is zero. Yeah. This means screw you and sign. Yeah, screw you and sign. Like sign language? Yeah. Be careful. And in, uh, also in, in, in Morocco, they think this is, this is okay, right? Yeah. Somebody do this to you, you're, you're no problem? <laughs> no problem with you? Somebody looks at you and says, hey, what does it mean? It means you're crazy. That means, it also means that you're getting ready, you're ready for a fight. So you don't do this to somebody in, in you know, the Arab world, because this means you stop your car, or you try to hit the other person with your car, and, you know, fight is in the Okay, so there's the motions. We're done. We have the exam on Thursday. Wait, 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 wait.